I'm Manisha Dekka, and I teach animal law at the University of Victoria in Canada. In this documentary series, you'll discover the many ways that our Western legal systems fail to protect animals, and also what you can do to make a difference. You'll hear the views and experiences of youth active in animal protection, and of professionals who make animal advocacy their life work. In this episode, we'll learn about animal sanctuaries and what it's like to start an animal sanctuary, including the first wild whale sanctuary. But first, what is an animal sanctuary? An animal sanctuary is a facility where animals are brought to live and to be protected for the rest of their lives. Frequently, what distinguishes a sanctuary from other institutions is the philosophy that the animals come first. Many sanctuaries are accredited through the Global Federation of Animal Sanctuaries. It all started when I visited Farm Sanctuary in Watkins Glen, New York. That was what really started my passion um, for advocating for non-human animals, because I realized it wasn't just enough for me to be vegan and to abstain from eating animals, but I, I had to be a part of the solution to animal agriculture, and I really had to make a difference in my community. I wouldn't sit down for other social justice issues and be silent. So I decided I wasn't gonna be silent for animals any longer. And it's truly the individual animals and their stories that inspire me every day and that's what keeps me going. Um, I think a lot of folks would agree. Like for example, they have cats and dogs um, and they treat them as a member of their family. And having visited sanctuaries, just sort of seen how at ease um, these animals can be, should be. They, they shouldn't be treated as a means for profit, which they are across every industry, really. But I think the biggest turning point for me was when my family got chickens when I was nine years old. And I realized how amazing they were and that they were just as special and intelligent and unique as the dogs and cats that I had um, grown up with my entire life. And a little less than a year after we got the chickens, I found out about factory farming and particularly the egg industry. I just couldn't believe that chickens, just like the chickens that I loved so much at home, were going through this unimaginable cruelty and so I went to my mom one day and I said, hey, can we start a chicken rescue? And she was like, maybe. Um, and I was like, oh, my God, she didn't say no. Um, so I just hopped into it and started um, building a website. I named my organization and my mom agreed that we could rescue 12 chickens from a local egg farm. Um, and then we couldn't stop. And um yeah, that was kind of how I, I initially got involved in the world of, of animal rights. So when I, uh, I think I was, uh, I don't know, 23 years old and I, I went to India and I told my dad, I want to visit a Pandra pole, which is an animal sanctuary in India. And my dad took me to the sanctuary and I was so inspired by seeing so many animals living their best lives. There were no uh, chains around them. There were no like leashes. They were just all kind of coexisting together, being fed by very loving, caring attendants. I donated like 10% of my salary to this Pandra pole. And I thought, okay, one day this is, this is like, this has to come to America. This has to be in America. People have to see this. And when I learned about Farm Sanctuary as as a sanctuary, similar to the one that I, I mean, less populated, but similar to the one that I visited in India, I thought, gosh, this is, I want to be part of this. I want to, I want to be with those animals. I want to help this organization. Yeah, as I mentioned before, um, it kind of all started when um, my family got chickens and the first rescue that we did, uh, we rescued 12 hens from a local egg farm. So this was a local factory farm. So. We got them home, we got them to safety, and we put them in um, a coop we had recently built for them. And their combs were pale, very, very pale, because they'd been in these dark barns and they'd never seen sunlight before. They'd never seen the sky. And just knowing that all of those chickens were 
having their lives completely transformed, that they were seeing the sun for the first time, feeling dirt for the first time because we rescued them was the most powerful experience that maybe I've ever had, being able to see um, just like the astonishment on their faces. Uh, and, you know, they, they would cock their heads and look up at the sky. And it was just, just a really magical experience, honestly. And my mom and I, I think we both knew pretty immediately that, um, you know, we, we had to help more um, and give more chickens, more animals in general, the opportunity to see the sky for the first time and um, be safe and, and free from um, this industry. Yeah, um, my biggest inspirations are two people, Susie Costin and Jean Bauer. Jean Bauer founded Farm Sanctuary. I met Jean Bauer, I think on my 11th birthday, I went to a book signing event and I got to meet him. And I'm wearing a Farm Sanctuary sweatshirt right now. Yeah, but it's definitely my favorite organization. And seeing how they come at animal rights from both an direct action aspect with the animals that they rescue and also with an advocacy program and working with um, communities around the world to promote animal rights and plant-based diets. It's just truly one of the most incredible organizations around. I'm so inspired by the story of Gene Bauer and how he was so moved by seeing um, a pile of dead sheep and there was one that was kind of moving at the top of the pile and he grabbed her, he took her, he healed her and he named her Hilda and she was the first rescue of Farm Sanctuary and now it's this large organization that has a sanctuary in, in uh, upstate New York and uh, just outside of Los Angeles and we have I think close to a thousand animals that have been rescued and uh, so yeah, so Farm Sanctuary is is an incredible place, not just to visit, but even for employment. We have three pillars. We have a, a, a rescue division, we have an education division, and um, and we have an advocacy division. We talk about the federal subsidies, like $20 billion given to the meat and dairy industries, fueling foods that aren't respective of ancestral diets. And so we work on food policy. We work on uh, supporting national endeavors, such as Cory Booker's Farm Systems Reform Bill, which is designed to end factory farming. Yeah, we um, applied for our 501c3 status and put together a board and um, started getting volunteers from the local community and hiring staff and became a, a real organization. And now we've rescued over a thousand animals from factory farms, slaughterhouses, and other abusive situations like cockfighting and hoarding situations and, and things like that. We currently have, I believe, eight pigs um, at the sanctuary. Uh, we have two cows, uh, we've got goats, sheep, chickens, obviously, turkeys, geese, ducks, uh, all sorts of animals rescued uh, from factory farms and from slaughterhouses. And, you know, they're all just such wonderful, unique individuals and getting to know them has, has been honestly a, a, a real honor, uh, I think, for, for all of us at Happy and Animal Sanctuary uh, and to, to see how their personalities come out after they've been rescued. I think that to a large extent, um, this work of understanding our relationships can happen in the sanctuary world, um, the world of animal sanctuaries, both sanctuaries for formerly farmed animals, animals that might have been released from certain kinds of industrial production facilities that might have escaped from those facilities, and also animals that get confiscated um, by uh, law enforcement and animal control um, because they were being treated badly. They go to sanctuaries and I think a lot can be learned um, from those um, relationships that develop for those animals. The same thing with the chimpanzee sanctuaries um, and the other sanctuaries for wild animals. And I think that this is an area that would be particularly exciting for thinking about cases to um, imagine how the law might be able to um, facilitate um, ongoing sanctuary work. And also to be honest, 
um, to play a certain role in setting a certain set of standards or guidelines um, for that. Um, our steer Buddha, when he was rescued, he was just a week old calf and he was skin and bones. He had severe pneumonia. Uh, he, he was rescued from a factory dairy farm. And we honestly, for months, weren't sure he was going to make it. It took months for his fever to break. Uh, but I, even though he was so sick, I remember the first time that he touched the ground at Happy Hen Animal Sanctuary after spending his, his, week, his one week of life in a, in a veal crate on this factory farm. Uh, he like jumped for joy and like danced around and he was so weak he fell on his face but he got right back up and danced around again he was just so happy even though he was so sick and had been through so much and today he's like 2,000 pounds probably uh, he's a really big guy so he's just a total sweetheart um and if he hadn't been rescued, he would have ended up at the uh, Harris Ranch feedlot, which is a um, massive feedlot um, in Central California. Um, so I'm very grateful that um, he didn't have to go through that and we were able to rescue him so young. I met a mother cow and her babies had been stolen from her her entire life. And she was just incredibly depressed and lethargic. But when she came to Farm Sanctuary, and she was finally allowed to live out her life the way she was intended to live out her life. It was truly eye-opening to see how she blossomed as an individual. And that's what made me abstain from all animal products, was realizing that even though animals are murdered in the dairy industry, but whether or not the animals are killed, they're still being exploited and abused. But we all have the moral obligation to reduce the amount of suffering that we inflict upon other living beings as much as we possibly can. And for many people, that is by going vegan. Running an animal sanctuary is incredibly difficult and animal sanctuaries don't get nearly enough support um, as a whole. There's so many of these animals to take care of and a lot of them because of the past that they have of the abuse that they face, they have lifelong health issues. Also because of the way they've been genetically manipulated, uh, they have a lot of health issues. So for example, egg laying hens have been genetically modified to lay over 300 eggs every year when naturally they would only lay around 12 eggs every year. So this puts massive pressure on their bodies that they really just can't handle. Um, a lot of them end up needing surgery um, and you know, really intense supportive care that, that takes a lot of time. Additionally, you know, the, the animals who've been bred for meat, uh, they've, you know, been bred to grow a lot larger and a lot heavier um, than they naturally should. And this causes a lot of um, lifelong health issues for them as well. You know, a lot of our pigs have arthritis. Um, you know, we see chickens um, and turkeys from the meat industry who eventually, you know, lose the ability to stand or lose the ability to, to walk easily. A lot of this, you know, takes a lot of time uh, and staffing to take care of these special needs animals and also, you know, the vet bills of, of getting them surgery and um, getting them their medication. So it's, it's a lot of really hard work. I worked very hard trying to help shape policy that brought an end to chimpanzee research. And I also now track um, the remaining chimpanzees in laboratories as they moved to sanctuary um, in the United States. In the United States was the only country um, that was still experimenting on chimpanzees. Um, and we, uh, in 2015, a, a large group of uh, animal rights lawyers, animal organizations, but also many people in the scientific community came together to say, okay, uh, we shouldn't be experimenting on chimpanzees. This was a really important moment to actually preclude a certain level of research and on certain animals. And I think preventing uh, chimpanzees from being used in research um, was a tremendous advance. I've been studying uh, dolphins and whales and their brains for 30 years. Uh, I've also studied uh, brain evolution in mammals, self-awareness in other animals, and in the past 15 years, human, non-human animal relationships. And I am particularly interested in the intersection between science and animal law.
I'm the president of the Whale Sanctuary Project, but I founded it in 2016. And I founded it in response to what I came to learn about the dolphins and whales in Gore living in concrete tanks and marine parts. I started to look into what their well-being is like in these places, and I didn't like what I learned. Uh, and I thought, well, we need to change this. Um, but I also knew that there was no way we can work to get all of these animals, these dolphins and whales out of the tanks and put them back in the ocean because it, that, that would be a death sentence for them uh, because of the, they'd lack the survival skills. So what's the, what's the next best thing is sanctuary. And I looked around, I saw successful sanctuaries for elephants and primates and so many other animals. And I wanted to do something to give back to these animals that I'd studied for so long. And that is why I founded the Whale Sanctuary Project to enact, if you will, uh, a change in how we relate to dolphins and whales by uh, taking what we know and, and creating a new relationship with them through sanctuary. The Whale Sanctuary Project is in Nova Scotia in a big, beautiful bay called Fort Hilford Bay. It's on the eastern shore of Nova Scotia. We found it after two years of searching on both coasts of North America. It is next to a beautiful little town called Sherbrooke. And the people there are, have embraced the project. It's over 100 acres of water space. We'll have veterinary care. It will do education. And it will be the first sanctuary for belugas and orcas in North America and anywhere in the world, really, in terms of the amount of space that we're providing. So we want this to really be a gold standard for how we can create more sanctuaries all over the world. Obviously, that, you know, the, the labor of it um, is really hard, but I, I would say the other um, biggest battle that, that we face, and I think all animal sanctuaries face, is honestly the loss. The loss takes a real toll on all of us in the rescue world because we spend so much time caring for these animals, loving these animals, and unfortunately, a lot of them don't live very long because of the cruelty that they faced and the genetic modification that they've faced at the hands of the meat industry and the egg industry and the dairy industry. So, you know, we have to uh, do a lot of end of life care, supporting them and keeping them comfortable for as long as we can before they eventually pass away. It's just so heartbreaking um, knowing that their deaths are so unnecessary and that their bodies shouldn't have been used like they were, and that they deserved to live such long lives that they deserved um, to never have to have gone through the trauma that they went through. You know, being on the sanctuary and feeling that peace, that Zen, watching these animals, the way they look at you, the way you look at them, the way they, they're just living out their lives. Like the, the cows there have a potential life of 18, 20 years. They're all, all animals in the farm industry are killed as babies. And so it's quite remarkable to see animals beyond the toddler phase, living their beautiful lives at the sanctuary. So I, I strongly suggest to anyone, come, you'll, you'll remember it for a long time.